It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to the Jill on Money show. We are delighted that you are joining us. This championship weekend, football players, football fans alike are excited. Mark and I are excited because we have many of your voices for this show. And what is our job here? Our job at the Jill on Money show is to take the mystery out of your financial life. That's what we do. That's our, our, our unifying message across every platform. We want to try to make it a little bit better for you. And the way we make it better for you is that you send us emails, you send us your questions. And now, through the miracle of technology, we bring you on, even though everyone's at working from home. So just send us an email with your question. Remember, it's askjill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Hey, the Jill on Money radio show, we are sponsored by Facet Wealth. Facet Wealth is kind of cool. Um, the you you heard one of the guys who was one of the, the bosses at Facet Wealth a couple of weeks ago, Brent Weiss, and he said something very funny to me um, off the air, which I'm going to repeat, and he may really make me feel bad for repeating this, but it was so funny. He says it's sort of like financial planning for the yachtless, meaning financial planning for lots of you who would like some financial advice, you want access to a certified financial planner, but you don't feel like you have a ton of money to get it. So you may want to check out facetwealth.com. They provide goal-based financial planning. They give you a dedicated advisor. There's no call center person, and they do not have any wealth or account minimums. So that is kind of neat. Facet Wealth, they say, they meet you where you are. I think that's kind of great. That's what we do here. So it's a great partnership for 2021. We're very happy to have Facet Wealth. Check out facetwealth.com and you can see more of what's going on over there. How's that, Mark? That was pretty good for uh, a spot that's not written yet. What do you think? Oh, please. He, he, He made me, he actually made me blush a little bit. He said, that's why you're the talent. All right. Calm down, though. I know. He doesn't really mean all of that, does he? (laughs) Okay. So remember, um, we here at this program, we want to answer your financial questions. But, you know, maybe if you want to remain anonymous, that's no problem. There's a lot of resources on our website at jillonmoney.com. You can click on the contact button while you're there. If you want to see all the different things that are going on, just head over to that website. It's kind of our hub. And you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Mark puts it out every Friday, and it's fantastic. Today, we are starting with a caller, one of your voices. It's Anthony from Arkansas. Hello, Anthony. Welcome to Jill on Money. What can I do for you, sir? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I have a couple of questions regarding some of the moves that I'm making in my retirement. When I initially started my job, I was informed that there was a, for our 403B, I was informed that there was a 6% mandatory contribution. However, my employer would match up to 10% dollar for dollar. Wow. Dollar for dollar? Holy moly. So I did the responsible thing and I said, okay, I'm going to contribute up to the match. Mm -hmm. And I've also just over the years been doing a little bit extra as well. And currently what I'm doing is the 10% in order to get what I thought was the match. And then there's also a Roth 403B option. And I throw another 3% there as well. Okay. Um, So 10% into the pre-tax, 3% into the Roth. Yes. And what I thought originally was that the 10% was matched dollar for dollar, which that is partially true. Either I misheard or the rules have changed um, because what the rules are now apparently is that the 6% mandatory, that's, I understood correctly, but apparently the 10% comes in regardless. Wait a minute. So what you're saying is 
the 6%, you have to put 6% in, but the organization is putting 10% in regardless of whether you're putting 10% yourself away, right? That is my understanding. Okay. That sounds good. I, I bet that that's right. Are you, do you work for a university? I do work for a university. Yeah. That's often the education, higher ed, I've seen this a lot. Um, and obviously, one thing that you should just clarify is to make sure you understand the rules as they stand today. But often they'll say, you know, no matter what you put in, once you get to that 6%, because they're make forcing you to do that, we'll put 10% in. So that that is pretty standard. So how old are you? Let's start with that. I am 41. Okay. Married, single? I'm uh, married and my wife is 38. Okay. Kids? None. Plan to? None. <laughs> Ooh, that's what I like. That sounds like some good retirement planning right there, my friend. So right at this point, tell me a little bit about the nature of other stuff going on in your financial life. For example, how much money's in the 403B right now? Well, right now I have 250 in the 403B. Mm -hmm. I have... 52 in the Roth 403B. Okay. I have 40 in an IRA that I rolled over from a previous employer. Mm -hmm. And I have another 23 in a Roth IRA that I contributed to before the 403B option became a thing. I gotcha. Who is the, the custodian of your 403B right now? Like what firm is it? Yeah. Held it? TIA. Fabulous. How much money you guys make? Um, put together, we make about 110. And does your wife have a retirement plan as well? She has a retirement plan, but unfortunately, I do not know uh, much about it. Okay. So the, num the numbers I'm giving you are mine. Okay. But she has some money floating yes. around. Good. Uh, what else you got? What's out there? Got some emergency reserve money for uh, Aunt Jill here? You make me feel very happy if you do. Um, we've got about 55000 in um, just sitting in checking and savings. Mm -hmm. And we also, for whatever reason, we thought that a few months ago was the perfect time to move into a new house. <laughs> well, you know, it and, happens when it happens, right? And I'll, tell, and I'll tell you that the real estate market in central Arkansas is absolutely crazy. If you if you are buying or selling a house below a certain price point, if you're selling, you won't be in the market for long. And if you're buying, you better jump on something if you like it. So tell me how much did you spend on the new house? The contract price was 185 and we have a and we put 20% down and we have a 15 year at two and a quarter. Two and a quarter. Good God. Whew. Wow. The new house, you're putting money away in your retirement account. We don't know exactly what your wife is doing, but like your cash flow is good? Cash flow is good. Yes. Great. We'll get back to Jill on money in just a second. Hey, here's an idea. During the break, if you want to hear more of us, why don't you subscribe to our podcast? It is daily and it is called Jill on money. You can get it wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Just go and find it. Get it now. Jill on Money. It's the podcast. Okay, we'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. It's a big weekend, big football weekend. Mark, who are you rooting for in the Bills versus Kansas City, Packers versus Bucks matchups? Who, who's on your uh, list there? Okay, Mark is in the tank for the Packers. I, as well noted here, and I've said it many times on the air, I have been rooting for the Bills all season long because they are the only team that still plays in the state of New York. So I'm a Bills person. Mark's a Packers fan. Maybe we'll have a little Super Bowl wager, Mark, if they end up in it together. What do you think? You're on board with that? Okay, the usual Mortimer. That's a, an old Trading Places reference. Um, that would be the $1 bet. Maybe we'll bet a uh, Bitcoin. 
<laughs> okay. All right. So listen, um, we are here to take the mystery out of your financial life. And we'll get back to um, Anthony, our caller, in just a second. But I do want to remind everybody that, you know, when you are going through these transition periods, and I really do believe we are in a transition period in this country, um, not just administration transfers, uh, transitions, but uh, economic transitions. You know, we came out of last year and I think the economy was growing and then things slowed down as the virus was spiking and we got that $900 billion second stimulus bill. Now we have another stimulus bill that President Biden has now unveiled. It's a negotiation. It's $1.9 trillion. But if you want to read all about that plan, that stimulus plan, because it's not a bill yet, go to jillonmoney.com because there are a lot of nuances to this uh, plan. I I don't know if they're all going to get through, but some of them are very much focused on COVID and providing relief, but others are trying to do things like raise the minimum wage from seven and a quarter an hour to $15 an hour. Hey, Mark, you know, when I was doing a little research for this, wasn't it interesting, because I'm sure you read this very closely, that the federal minimum wage actually peaked in 1968. That's according to Pew Research. Unbelievable, right? So a lot, but it's going to get a lot of attention. I don't know if it's going to get through. Um, I'm sure that um, there's going to be a lot of conversation about how we can do things to help people right this minute and maybe not do some of these longer term goals of the Biden administration. But I don't care. I want money pumping into the economy because it's going to still need help. Because while the virus is raging, and make no mistake, it is still raging, we must be clear that the economy will suffer as a result, okay? All right. Now, we're going to get back to our listener question from Anthony in Arkansas. Remember, he recently purchased a home with a 15-year mortgage. So here's the rest of our conversation with Anthony. You know, obviously, because you're young, I would have said, gosh, I would have preferred you being a 30-year mortgage, but it's done and you just did it and it's cheap. So we'll stay with what you got. A couple of things that rise to like the, I'm sure you've thought about this already. They're going to put the 10% match in no matter what. So you're going to put the 6% into your 403B, but then shift everything else to the Roth option, okay? Whatever else. So you don't, you don't need, you can put up to your 6%, but right now you said your 3% Roth can, you know, you, with the 4% that was going in extra, right, for the, the traditional, shift that to the Roth. Put 10% in. It sounds like you could probably afford it. You're in a cheap tax bracket. You know, you're married, you're filing jointly, you're um, you're in the 22% tax bracket. It's all good. So I would just go, you know, 6% pre-tax in the 403B, put 10% in the Roth 403B. You got plenty of money. That's all good news. Here's something to consider. The IRA rollover, that 40 some thousand dollars from the old 457, I would actually find out if TIAA would take that 40 something thousand dollars and roll it into your 403B. See if you can roll that back into TIAA. I love TIAA. If you have to pick a company um, with really cheap expenses and is well run, I think TIAA is a good one. And it might behoove you to kind of have most of your, let's call it your pre tax money. It would be great to just have it all there at TIAA. And that will allow you to just sort of say, okay, it's in one place, manage it there and not worry a bit about it. Okay. And I'm sure it'll be cheaper than wherever you do it. Are you doing it yourself? Are you managing your own money in the rollover? Uh, no, I, I have it at a, I have it at another firm. Is it like your brother who's managing? No, 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 no. no. Okay. I'm about to tell you to fire that other firm. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, because I would just take that rollover and just help pop it right into the existing TIAA, if they'll take the money, you have to find out whether they'll take it. And the Roth IRA that you have, um, you know, if you want to have someone, you want to pay someone to manage it, fine. Of course, I'm always into like, just go to Vanguard or go to, you know, go someplace where it's cheap to manage it and use index funds and don't look back, essentially. Do you guys have um, your estate documents done? You got wills and powers of attorney and healthcare proxies? I do, but... It's been a while since I've looked at them and 
So one of the things that's on my to-do list over the next couple of weeks is just going back and reviewing those documents. Great. You said that you made $110,000 together with your wife. Are you the primary? Is it split equal? Like, how does it split up for you two? I, I am. I'm definitely the primary on it. Most of that is mine. Okay. I mean, the only reason I ask that is that do you also have life insurance? I have a little bit of life insurance, but basically it's enough to make sure that if God forbid something happened to me that my wife could pay off the house and be done with it. And fortunately, um, our home is our only um, major debt. I've got a car note, but that thing's going to be paid off in a couple of months. Well, I would still probably look at life insurance because, you know, God forbid you drop dead tomorrow. If you're the primary wage earner, you're also the primary vehicle for retirement savings. So if you want your wife to be taken care of so that she and her next husband can have a nice life. Okay. I say that very sarcastically. That was a little humor for you. No, but really, if you want to try to make sure that that's the case, you're young, you're healthy. Now's the time to make sure that, you know, over the at least maybe say like a 15 year term policy that just, you know, if something bad happened before you had all of the money saved that you need to have saved for retirement, that should be taken care of. So I think it's worth going into uh, any insurance calculator and determining whether or not you guys have enough. My guess is you need a little bit more. Okay. And other than that, it sounds like you're in good shape. Did I miss anything? Are you an aggressive investor? Should I be worried that you're taking too much risk? What's happening for you? No, I, I've always been aggressive, but not very aggressive. I know I pretty much understand that I have a little bit of time on my side, but at the same time, you know, 20 years ago, if you would have told me that this was my situation, I would have never believed you. And yet, and yet here I am. So that's really terrific. Well, I think you're in great shape. And um, if you need anything else, um, uh, let me know. But I would be remiss if I didn't say one little extra thing, which is even if you're not managing your wife's money, but like you should just make sure you're both on the same page. Like, hey, honey, if I drop dead, here's where my stuff is. This is how you get access to it. That's sort of part of your maybe in your wills and taking a look at everything. It's like I said, I mean, you may want to keep your assets separate, but because you're probably the beneficiary of each other's accounts and everything, it's worth just having a conversation. Say, like, here's where everything is so that you know what she has. I mean, and she knows what you have. It's funny you mentioned that. Another thing that's on my to-do list, you know, after reviewing all of my documents and stuff is basically putting together a document, you know, basically a dear wife letter where if that happens to me, she's got a single page that says, here's where everything is, here are yes. Dot, dot. Yes, 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 exactly. So um, that's part of the estate stuff. So that's easily done. Try to make sure that you get that managed in the process. And uh, I wish you the best of luck. So I think you're in really good shape. Keep doing what you're doing and keep accessing that Roth. I think you're going to be really happy that you have done so, okay? Um, well, I very much thank you for your advice and thank you for your time. Okay, Anthony, thank you so much for joining us on the program. If you would like to join us on the program, remember, because we are broadcasting virtually, we'd love to have you join us. So send an email with your question, Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com and Mark will do the rest. For now, just take a deep breath and send us your email, askjill at jillonmoney.com, and we'll figure out what's the best plan of action for you. Okay, we'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are broadcasting from the Capital One Bank Virtual Studios. Capital One, this is banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? So if you have a financial question, maybe you've got a tax question that's coming up, because by the end of this month, you should have all of your tax documentation. So get ready, be be prepared, especially if you think you're due a refund. You got to jump on this. And for goodness sakes, please, gang, none of this paper filing, everything electronic. Remember, the electronic filers, they all got their stimulus payments before the paper filers. 
All right. Now we've got another one of you who wants to join us on the air. Makes me so happy. So Kelly from North Carolina is up next. Kelly, welcome to Jill on Money. What can we do for you? A little background on myself. I am 27 going on 50. And I say that kind of jokingly because my financial goal is to retire by age 50. Uh, By that point, I want to work because I want to, not because I have to. Uh, that's probably easier said than done because I don't have a wife and kids in the picture right now, but wanted to get a report card from you pretty much to see where I am as far as being on track and what else I can do uh, to make that process reality. Okay, great. So first of all, are you working right now? Yes. So background on myself, I am in sales right now uh, in a tech role. So I'm in the ballpark of about 100000 annually. No debt right now. I have the exception of a primary mortgage and two investment properties. Um, So I'm working to scale the real estate side to get at least one or two properties a year, eventually supplement my full-time income with the the real estate side. Wow. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You said you're 27. You own your own house, right? You own a house, your primary. How much is that worth? Um, So the primary right now, I can get about 210 on the market and I owe about 180. So I've had it for about a year and a half. Great. Tell me about the rental property. Same deal. Give me the the fair market value and the outstanding mortgage amount. So the the properties are pretty inexpensive. Um, just to put it in perspective, one of the mortgages is about one hundred and forty dollars a month, but the property value for the first one is thirty four thousand, and I think I've got about eight thousand in equity. And then the same with the second property is now worth twenty thousand. Um, and I've got about 8000 after doing some renovations this summer. Hold on a second. I don't understand. $34,000 for a house? That's what you get in the South. What? This is <laughs> insanity. Okay. So these are super cheap. They're cash flowing positive. Is that right? Yes. No. Even with the pandemic, no problem with uh, paying rent. Everything has still come on time and, and had no issues with the houses. Fantastic. So that is great. And your primary, you're happy there? You want to kind of stick around? Is that the game plan? Eventually, it'll become part of the investment portfolio. Um, At the time, I told myself I wanted to get my hands on a house because it just made more sense to own rather than rent. It's a Mm -hmm. a fairly new property. It's only about four years old. So I haven't had the, uh, you know, the busted water heater or any, you know, HVAC issues or anything like that. So knock on wood, so far, it's been so good. That's fantastic. So let me ask you a question about this. This is uh, kind of intriguing to me. So you've got this income, you're able to buy these rental properties. Uh, Are you contributing to your retirement account? Yeah, so I am maxing out the six uh, percent contribution through my company. Um, I just recently switched that over to a Roth four hundred one k. That was actually one of the questions that I had, but I'll get to that in a second. Outside of that, because my retirement age is going to be fifty, uh, I'm working on a, a brokerage account. This is split up between Edward Jones and Robinhood, so it, it's more towards the Edward Jones side. But when the pandemic hit, I was one of those millennials who got addicted to. Uh, looking at trading. Everything has been long-term plays, so I'm not looking into options or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do have a little bit of a cushion there of about 50,000 and the 401 at work is about uh, 100,000. So the 401k was the traditional 401k before you started using the Roth 401k, right? Correct. Okay. And you're putting 6% into the Roth 401k because your company matches up to 6%, correct? That's right. Okay. You have an emergency reserve fund that's not the Edward Jones or the Robinhood accounts? Yes. I've got about eight months saved up for my emergency fund and Mm -hmm. then the, like I said, the equity on the properties too. Mm -hmm. Okay. First of all, I just interviewed somebody. You'll hear this podcast. uh, I don't think if this drops before or after this will air, but um, who is a hater of Robinhood. It did kind of perk me up a little bit because I'm not a huge fan of it either. I mean, if you want to have a brokerage account, that's fine, but I'm not into gamification of long-term investing. I, I know it's, it's attractive. It's like going down the rabbit hole and seeing where everyone in high school is on Facebook, but it's like, you know, you feel icky after you've done that. So I put that out there as a warning. I get the game plan. I get that you want to do the rental property. I think you could be putting more into your retirement account. I think you should be putting more money into the Roth 401k, not that say that you're in a low tax bracket, but you probably have some good write-offs because of the re- rental property. It sounds like if you're doing a hundred grand a year right now and you're 27, you're probably going to be making more money in the future. So 
I like using that Roth and I think that Roth would be great for you. You know, I'm not such a huge fan of going crazy and buying so much rental property because it's like any other asset class. Essentially, you know, I don't want you to be overextended in any one asset class unless, you know, you really think, you know, Kelly, that this is something you're going to do, you know, when you're 50 is that you're going to be the landlord and the management company all rolled into one. So I really would want you to focus on that Roth 401k. Do you think that you could uh, make that happen? Yeah, absolutely. And that was um, something else that I just uh, recently figured out. I guess that it was a question and I, I was one of those that you don't know what you don't know. So mm-hmm. with the the Roth, I just spoke to the um, brokerage company and they mentioned that there's about 57,000 right now that could be converted to a Roth 401. I know that would be a, a big tax implication. So I wonder, is it worth splitting, you know, maybe half of that for 2020 and then the other half for 2021 from a tax standpoint? I mean, look, I don't think you need to convert anything. I think that you just put new money into the Roth. I mean, you can put up to $19,500 into a Roth 401k. So I don't think you have to take the tax hit right now and convert it. But I do think that it makes sense that you bump up your Roth. In other words, instead of 6%, I'd max out the Roth 401k. You you know, in a few years, you're going to be, you know, you're, you're going to be flipping. You're going to all of a sudden say like, oh, my Roth 401k is worth way more than my traditional and leave the traditional alone. Okay. If you, like Kelly, would like to come on the program with us, send us an email with your question, your financial question, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com or do it from our website, jillonmoney.com. Tell us, I want to come on the air with you. Mark does the rest. It's so easy. It's so easy. All right. So for now, we will go take a break. And during that break, why don't you go to jillonmoney.com, poke around a little bit and bookmark it so you can get to it really quickly next time. Okay. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here to help you figure out what's next for you in 2021 in your financial life. What is next for you? Where do you want to go? We can help figure that out with you. You know, think of us as like that nice coach, that nice enthusiastic coach who's prompting you to do all sorts of great things. Do that. Do that. Send us a note. Let us help you. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That is our email address. And if you're on our website, if you're on jillonmoney.com, all you need to do is click the contact button. It's very easy. All right. So Anonymous is writing about a Section 457 plan or a Roth Section 457 plan. So here's the note from Anonymous. Hello, Jill and Mark. I am so thankful I found the Jill and Silent Mark podcast a year ago. So remember, gang, we have a sister podcast every single day, okay? Every day we pump out that content. It's like maybe 10, 12 minutes. So check it out, the Jill on Money podcast. You can go to our website and get more information. It's right on the front door. Mark's made it very easy for you. Okay, let's get back to Anonymous. He says, you're always encouraging but firm, and I like your safe style of investment recommendations. I have a couple of questions, but first, a little bit about myself. I started over again from zero at age 52. Five years later, he's 57, he's single, he's debt-free, joyous, and working my way diligently towards a safe retirement. I really enjoy personal finance. I read books and blogs and listen to podcasts when I get a chance. Okay. I have a nine-to-five job in education. It pays $50,000 a year. Two years ago, I started an elected public service position at a little over $20,000. I started a new four-year term, and depending on election outcome and my desire to continue serving, I may end that second job after 2024. You know, big picture, I earn about $70,000 gross now, may go back into the 50s after four years until retirement. Okay, good. So now you got some extra moolah. After life and my choices set me back to zero in 2015, I've now accumulated $117,000. 
$6,800 in a 403B through my nine to five job, $43,000 in a brokerage account with Vanguard, uh, nearly $36,000 in a Roth IRA with Vanguard, $32,000 in a 457 plan through my public service job. This is amazing. I contribute $2,400 a month, 42% of my pay. And he carves it up between all those different things. Okay. He, he wants to max out his Roth, which he does. And whatever's left over goes into his brokerage account. I've got a globally diversified portfolio as tax efficient as I can in the various accounts using exchange traded funds and index funds. He's got a breakdown, 65 stock, 35 bonds. He's got 12 grand in an emergency reserve fund. I am securing my education job and I plan to work till 67. All right. At that time, I will have a pension, which should be $1,500 a month and social security of $2,500 a month. Also may receive an inheritance of three to $400,000 from a parent. I don't plan on that. Life insurance to bury me and I will make sure my assets go where I want them to go. I hope to retire with a nest egg of about a half a million dollars. Not the best, but I know I live frugally at just over $2,000 a month and think 40 grand a year in today's dollars certainly would be sufficient for a nice lifestyle in retirement. I understand future health expenses and long-term care matters um, are things that I will have to factor in. Although I don't know if you will have to, because if you have a pension, don't you actually have health insurance? Sound like you're in very good shape, Anonymous. So the first question that Anonymous asks is, public service job. He invests uh, pretty much all of his salary. Now he's got a Roth 457. The recommendations are that I should always opt for a Roth, but I've heard of a mix of pre and Roth retirement accounts are good. Also, my income changes could be a factor, and I'm at an age later in life that I don't get to take as much advantage of compound and favorable tax treatment. In your judgment, should I change 457 to the Roth for at least the next four years, which will accumulate about another $64,000 before tax or growth considerations? Mark, do you want to do the Roth in the 457? I do too. I want to do the Roth for the 457, no doubt. You're going to have income when you retire. You know, that's that's four grand a month is, that's real income. And, um, and I think that it, it's going to be great for you to know that some of your money has already been taxed. And I, so I say, yes, do it. Okay. So does Mark. By the way, Mark and I are both certified financial planners, not just me. Okay. Second question. Realism versus greed. This is where I anticipate your firm guidance to be helpful, Jill. Oh, boy. All right, here we go. In light of the dismal performance of bonds today, I've read many articles and heard podcasts recommending that v- investors venture away from the nominal bonds to include more dividend-paying stocks, REITs, TIPS, and other options. My investment mis- mix has performed well in the last five years, but do you think I should apportion some of the 35% bond mix to these other options rather than just Vanguard bond funds? Mark, would you like to weigh in on that? Because you know what I'm going to say. So you might as well just tell me what you think. Mark says, hell no. And I say, hell no. So no, stick to it. If you want to weave into your stock position, some dividend producing funds, sure. And throw some REITs in there, fine. You can certainly put tips into your bond mix, but none of the other, um, nothing else equity, okay? So that's it. Tips are treasury inflation protected securities. The tips are bonds. So that's okay if you want to make that part of your bond mix, but none of the others. Okay, that's it. If you've got a nice question, nice juicy question like that, let us know. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we head to our break, we want to squeeze another email question from you in. Remember, if you've got a financial question, all you have to do is send us a note. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And of course, you can always send us a, a note or a question from our website, so our website is jillonmoney.com. Just hit the contact button. Okay. 
Uh, all right. Don says, uh, I am 75 years old and retired for approximately 15 years. I gave up on the stock market years ago and basically invested in real estate. That's great. Fantastic. Good for you. No immediate family, just me and my wife. Don writes, I am liquidating the real estate and would be interested in a couple of recommendations for parking my funds somewhere with little or no, all caps, risk. Uh, annual income is approximately $80,000. Well, I mean, look, if you want no risk, you're just going to have to go to depositaccounts.com start looking at some options. Now, I will also point out to you, I don't know where you, what state of residence you're in, but considering that, you know, you guys, you're, you know, if you have $80,000 of income, you're in the 12% tax bracket, even if it's taxable income to you, you know, it's 12%. It's, it's not terrible. I think that if you're in a high state income tax location, I guess you could just sort of weigh whether a municipal bond fund would make sense or not, but that would be about it. That would be little risk, but not no risk. For no risk, it's cash or cash equivalents. And that's unfortunately not going to get you a lot. But if you continue to have income and you really don't want risk, I don't suppose there's a lot of choices for you. So if you look at depositaccounts.com and, um, you know, I'm not sure that that's something that's going to be very exciting to you because I'm sure that when you compare that to the yield you've been getting from your real estate, you're not going to be happy. But check it out, depositaccounts.com. Okay, good luck. All right. When we return, we're going to get to more of your questions. Jill on Money will be right back. the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering that can only mean one thing it's time for jill on money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances here's your host jill schlesinger you're back it's our number two of the jill on money show we're so happy you're with us this is great fantastic uh, Mark and I are here to try to help you figure out where to go next in your financial life. And we are really so happy that we have partnered with Facet Wealth. They are our sponsor for 2021. You may have heard our interview with uh, one of the folks at Facet Wealth a few weeks, a couple weeks ago, I guess it was two weeks ago, Brent Weiss, who is a CFP himself and now has become what he calls the chief evangelist for the company. I met uh, the folks at Facet Wealth a few years ago, and I was very interested in them because they've done something that I had actually tried to do when I was a financial advisor, which was to create a flat fee, conflict-free planning model. They seem to be able to do it. I, I don't know. I, I failed at it because we didn't have enough technology to help us. But it's been interesting to get to know this company a little bit better. They are accessible to the vast majority of you who are listening. And I think that's what's kind of cool. You get a dedicated financial advisor who is a CFP, a fiduciary, right? So that's when we say conflict-free means you're a fiduciary. No wealth or account minimums. It's kind of cool. So um, I, I'm hopeful that when uh, you get to know Brent a little bit better, he's going to be coming on the program um, with us to, to help us tackle some different topics in the future. Um, you get to know this company a little bit better as well. So anyway, check that out, facetwealth.com. Okay, now back to you, because that's what we're all about here. If you have a question that you would like us to tackle, all you have to do is send us an email. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And I suppose that we are going to start getting more and more tax questions. And, um, you know, again, I, I, I said this last hour, tax season opens later this year than usual. It's going to open on February 12th. 
And so I, I think it's really important that that you get your ducks in a row, get ready to file as quickly as possible, especially if you are due a refund. And by the way, even if you owe money, get your taxes done fast and then send them in at the last minute. Don't have to worry about it. All right. If you want to join us on the air, just let us know. That is what Joan did. She is from the Mid-Atlantic of the United States, where I'm sure she's nursing her wounds over the loss of the Baltimore football team and the Washington football team. Joan, welcome to Jill on Money. How can we help you out? Hi, Jill. Thank you so much for taking my question. And I really appreciate all you and Mark are doing to help everyone out. Uh, My question is about um, the RMDs from our... uh, our retirement plan, uh, the required minimum distributions, how to do that, and the mix of investments we have. So tell me a little bit about you. You said we, so I presume there's a spouse there. So um, first, let's do the basics. Uh, How old are you guys? I'm 66. My husband is 72. So we started taking the RMD when he was 70 uh, as required. We've just been taking the minimum. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were able to suspend it this year. Um, because of the, what, the CARES Act. Yep. So we have not been taking up, but what, obviously it will, it starts again this month. Got Um, it. We've been uh, doing it monthly in the past. We just wonder if we're doing it, how we're taking it out is correct um, and how we're doing that. So now tell us a little bit about how much money is in retirement accounts for each of you. Um, his is, it's all in TIAA. We've rolled everything into that uh, to make it easier. We both had long careers um, in uh, state government as far as administration in universities. So we have some money there in teaching. Uh, he has $985,000 in that account. I have uh, $211,000 in a TIAA account and $120,000 in a a Roth IRA. And the Roth is also a TIAA? It's at Vanguard. Oh, it's at Vanguard. Okay, good. And does your husband also have a Roth account or not? No. Okay. And uh, all right, so you got a bunch of money and um, you're, uh, I presume that TIAA, not obviously not for you yet, but says to your husband, hey, this is how much money you need to take out of this account this year, correct? Or do you have someone else who's doing that for you? Yeah, the TIAA figures that out. Great. I love that. I love when someone else does my business. And how much has it been approximately on the on an annualized basis? About thirty thousand. Okay. Do you need that thirty thousand to live on? No. Ah, interesting. Um, so far, I uh, used um, cash and other income so far, and Social Security. So right now, for Social Security, how much is coming in for each of you? Um, it's about 50,000 total. I should have asked this to begin with any other income in terms of, are you still working either of you or part-time or anything like that? My husband's doing something that brings in about 25,000 a year. So you've got the part-time income, you've got social security. So it's about 75 grand. Is that enough to support you guys? It's a little short. Um, we've done fine so far this year. Um, although okay, right. We've had some home projects that have um, we've spent some cash on that. What about um, sort of the the general other stuff going on, like a a cash account, like an emergency reserve fund, or any other investments that are out there? Um, we have about two hundred and forty thousand dollars in cash. Other stocks and bonds accounts totals about a, a little over a million in that. Wait. In addition to the, wait a second, are we saying, are you saying you're over a million in other non-retirement assets? Yes. Holy smokes, girl, you're in great shape. (laughs) That was a little bit of burying the lead. I was like, okay, well, they got to dip in. Okay. So you got a million dollars total. Are you guys managing this yourself? Have you hired someone to do this? The TIAA people um, have, have helped us um, rearrange all the investments. Um, mm-hmm. That's one of my questions. They've got us in about 19 different funds. Jeez. Uh, yes. It's all over the place. Um, we have an Edward Jones account that was is mainly inheritance bonds and some individual stocks that mm-hmm. um, is slowly, you know, turning to cash. Other than that, no. Okay. 19 funds. 
I don't know where to start with that, but let's think about this. Okay. Also, last question. House paid for? Um, what's its value? Is there a mortgage? What else is going on there? Um, we recently moved. We um, used the funds from, we tried to downsize, but didn't really succeed. Um, it's worth about 500000 and there's no mortgage, no other debt. So you guys are in great shape. Thank you. You're in great shape. You know, you obviously don't need your TIAA money, right? Um, the required minimum distribution. I mean, you need the money. I don't know if you need to be doing it monthly. If it's easier for you to do it monthly, just because that's fine. I generally try to say to people, if you don't really need the money, then maybe you can wait till the end of the year to take it. It's fine. It doesn't really matter. It's dotting I's and crossing T's there. Because you have so much money, um, there is this thing in my head that's starting to say, like, is there some reason that we need to convert some of this money out of uh, a traditional environment. I, I'm not sure it makes a ton of sense. We'll get back to Joan and finish up our conversation in just a minute. Hey, during the break, here's an idea. Go to the website, jillonmoney.com. And there you can actually subscribe to our sister broadcast. It's the Jill on Money podcast. We drop it every single day, seven days a week. So check it out. Okay, we'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here to try to help you figure out what the heck you're going to do next in your financial life. Like that. Um, Mark, you know, ever since we interviewed um, Christine Dercol, the Peloton instructor, I've been trying to think about something like some sort of mantra. You know, she was the she she if you miss that show, it's a great show. It, um, so the very interesting backstory of this Peloton um, cycling instructor and gold medal track cycling queen. But, you know, she has this mantra that I think is kind of cool. Um, and I know that Mark's going to roll his eyes when I say this, but I'm just going to say it anyway, because I've been thinking about like she has this great mantra. She just happened to say it organically during a spin class that she was teaching. I am, I can, I will, I do. And so I've been trying to think about like, what is the mantra that is the Jill on money mantra? Um, well, Mark wants to do like very boring ones, like less is more, keep it simple, stupid, but those are already like taken. I can't assume those. I have I have another one. You ready? I actually thought this was really good. It does definitely speak to my personality, but let's see how I'm gonna I'm gonna put it out there, and you guys will tell me what you think. And I like threes. I'm it's, I'm, a, I'm a three kind of person. Grit, growth, grace. Like you got to be gritty to get through this crap, this thing called life and, and, and certainly your financial life. You got to like, you got to work hard. Like you got to, you know, you have to have a little bit of muscle. You have to have the ability to get through stuff. No one does this perfectly. No one does this thing called manage your financial life really eloquently. They, I mean, yes, you could be lucky and born into money. That's certainly true, but you still need grit. Like that's awesome. And I, and I like that. Growth is like you've got to be able to learn from your mistakes. You've got to be able to grow as as a human being, as an investor, as someone who looks ahead. And then I thought grace was, you know, to, to be graceful in and 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 have gratitude for what you have. Maybe I should have. Do you, would you prefer me to say grit, growth, gratitude? I think I'm. Am I graceful? I don't know. I think that like having grace sort of gives you almost like a spiritual halo, which. I don't know. Maybe we'll see. Anyway, if you guys think that works, let us know. Grit, growth, grace. Okay. Mark says he likes grit, growth, gratitude. Maybe I'll write a post about that and then we'll see if people can weigh in. All right. Grit, growth, gratitude. We're going with it. All right. Let's get back to Joan's question. We're going to dive into some Roth conversions. Here's more of our conversation with Joan. You guys have some income you're in a low tax bracket right now. And if you think about, you know, the, the 30 grand that's just coming from your 
distribution. It looks to me like, you know, you, you, you probably are both, you know, you're in this comfortable 22% tax bracket. Has anyone at TIAA talked about converting a portion of either of your accounts into uh, Roth? No. I mean, like your TIAA, and let's leave your husband's alone for a second because he's already in the middle of distributions. There's an opportunity here because you've got some time, right? You've got six years before you have to start taking your required minimum distributions. It might be interesting to consider whether you take that TIAA $211,000 and start taking some of that money out and converting it into your Roth IRA. Maybe you move it to Vanguard. It doesn't really matter to me where it's held, but you convert it to a, a Roth. And the reason why you might want to do this is that, you know, obviously right now you're already in the 22% tax bracket. You might be able to say, hey, I'll take some more money out. I'll take money out of my TIAA, convert it to a Roth. You've got plenty of cash to pay the tax due. Your number one priority would be to make sure you remain in the 22% tax bracket. So you would not remove more. You wouldn't convert more money out of TIAA than would give you income of a total of about, let's just call it 170,000. So if you've already got, let's call it about 100,000, you wouldn't want to convert too much of this to pop you into another tax bracket. Here's the opportunity for you. And that is you pay the tax that's due now, you stay in the 22% tax bracket, you roll your TIAA money into the Roth money, and now you don't have to take distributions from your account. You just don't have to because it's already, you've already paid your tax. Considering that you don't need the money anyway and you got plenty of money overall, this might be a really good plan for you. The one thing that I'll tell you is that to do this right, I believe in your, um, you were kind enough to send me your your allocation. The, the portion of your TIAA that's in the guaranteed account has to come out over a slower period of time. So you may not be able to necessarily do that you usually can only move 10% out a year over 10 years. So I, I think that that would be a really good idea for you. And you won't burn up too much of your cash. You really won't. It'll be, you know, obviously you pay the tax, but you pay the tax that's due under these tax circumstances. Then you never have to worry about required minimum distributions for you. How do you feel about that? Sounds like a great idea. I like that too. Now for 19 funds seems like a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just going to point that out. You gave me your allocation, which is about 10% in the guaranteed, 70% in stocks, 7% in real estate, and fixed incomes, 13%. So essentially, you've got 20, 70, 10. Like, I don't know, that equity is probably a little bit high, but you have some cash in other areas. I, I'm not sure that you really need to do all of this. And and are you paying TIAA for any investment advice or does it just come because you're part of the system? It just comes part of the system. If we wanted to have them help us figure out where to bring the RMDs from, now there's a charge for that that we do. No, no, you don't need that. You don't need that. You don't need that. If you sent me the as a follow up all the different equity the funds, I, I'll promise you that what I would come to is that fine, keep your TIAA guaranteed, but for everything else, let's make this simple. You pick an index fund for U.S., an index fund for international. You pick the real. You stay in the real estate with TIAA. That's it. And like a couple of um, the for fixed income, pick one index fund. That's it. If anything, you maybe could have six funds total. But if you send me like a, just a screenshot of all your choices, I can help you out very easily. 19 is too many. It's silly. It's actually really like I don't understand. For a company that is really smart about so much, 19 funds is dumb. In terms of the other money that you have, the cash and the stocks and the bonds, are you managing that yourself? Uh, you said it was with an old inheritance, but are you getting advice on that or not? No, um, most of it's in Vanguard, uh, the Red and Edward Jones. Perfect. I mean, you probably could fire your Edward Jones and just put it all in Vanguard and make your life easy. This is a situation for me where someone's trying to like make this a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. You're in fantastic shape. 
um, for the RMD, kind of doesn't matter. Whatever you're going to take in the RMD, that 30 grand a year from your husband's TIAA should just be in cash and don't mess around with anything. Put it in cash in the beginning of the year. Hey, we're going to need about 30 grand. Put the 30 grand in cash. You can take it in the beginning of the year. You can take it at the end of the year. Does not matter. Totally doesn't matter. Just make sure the money that you're going to be pulling out over the course of the next 12 months is in cash. That's it. And how would you pull it out of the funds? It doesn't matter. There's no tax liability in doing this. So if you're going to just pull it out, I would say, look, you just had a great year. I'd probably take whatever is in the stock allocation that's in a more expensive fund. So my get, I'm just eyeballing it because you can send me in the email you sent, you sent some of the fund names like MFS or John Hancock or Nuveen. I just look at the cost of these funds. Anything that's not an index, uh, that's what I would be moving. Great. Good. Fantastic. Thank you so much. If you, like Joan, would like to join us on the broadcast, all you have to do is send us a message. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com and tell us what's going on in your financial life and then say, I want to come on the broadcast with you. I want to come on the show. And Mark will do the rest. Okay. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. I want to come on the show. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are broadcasting from the Capital One Bank Virtual Studios. Capital One, this is Banking Reimagined. What's in your wallet? All right, so uh, I got a bunch of emails here. People are going nutty right now about their financial lives. So Mark says, I got to stop yakking about grit, growth, and gratitude and get to your questions. If you'd like to send us a note, just uh, shoot us an email. Ask Jill at jillandmoney.com. Okay. This is a um, note from yet another anonymous person who is a single mom. And she goes on to say, I've struggled financially holding odd jobs for years. I got married and I was a stay-at-home mother. We divorced and I got a job paying $30,000 a year. Did that for three years. Over the summer, I got a job paying $55,000 a year. And at the same time, I became the recipient of an inheritance. It will end up totaling, you ready for this? Between $900 and $1.2 million. Holy smokes, that is a life changer. I own my home. I'm going to be selling it as soon as possible and buying another. I have to do this for a better school district for my son and quality of life. Okay. I plan to put 20% down on a home of $300,000 to $350,000. I have to save and invest the rest. Right now, I've got an appointment with a Vanguard financial advisor. What steps should I take? Any help would be appreciated. First of all, good for you. That sounds pretty gritty to me, huh, Mark? Uh, I think the first thing you should do is um, if you're meeting with someone, um, go to the website, jillonmoney.com. Click on the resource tab. And in that resource tab, you will see the questions to ask a financial advisor. And I think that you should not only talk to this Vanguard person, because I presume this is part of the Vanguard robo advisor, whether it's probably the personal service advisor, but I think that you should talk to other folks as well. So um, you can use the Schwab Intelligent Portfolio. You can contact our sponsor, Facet Wealth. And I think you should kind of see what the difference is among these and see what you like best. This is the first time you've had this much money. And we don't, we really want you to be able to find the right fit with a, an advisor. Check out those questions and that's what you should do. And I, I know you want to move into a house. I think it's fine. You're not, you know, going crazy, but just be careful not to spend too much of this money quickly. Okay. I get nervous when people come into money sometimes, mostly because I'm worried that people squander it or make big decisions quickly. Okay. So here's a message from. Karen, who says, 
I have a question regarding disability insurance for my 39-year-old son. He's married. He's got two children, ages three and one. His wife does not work outside the home. I've encouraged him to get disability insurance pronto. He finally got term life after I nudged him for over several years. After I bugged him, he says he did speak with someone at work about his disability coverage through the company, as well as about getting additional coverage outside of the work coverage. However, my son just tells me it is complicated because he's living and working overseas in Switzerland. I've Googled the topic. I've asked my financial planner, no help so far. Where can my son and his wife go to get guidance and purchase disability insurance as a resident of another country? Hmm. I mean, I think you've got to talk to a lawyer first because first, I don't know. I don't know about this. This is the second time we've gotten a question mark about, uh, about getting, um, help for people who are expats. And when I think I've had some clients, you know, when I was in the business a million years ago, I had some clients who were also expats living, um, you know, usually London based, sometimes in Europe. And it always started with the estate planning question. So what I would do is I would have your son and your daughter-in-law first start to um, make sure they have all of their estate planning in place and that they perhaps think about using that person, that attorney as the resource for help for um, navigating what's going on in their financial lives. Now, I'm not saying that this is, you know, sort of a cut and dry thing, because I, I don't think it is. But I would wonder, you know, what are the basic facts of their financial lives? And maybe they don't need the disability insurance. I, I'd be interested to learn what the coverage is. I'd be interested to learn how much money they earn. I would be interested to learn whether they are covered by any Swiss law. Wondering those things aloud just makes me believe that that we really probably need to have a conversation that is a broader financial planning conversation. So sorry, that's kind of vague, but there it is. Wendy writes, my husband is 46. I am 48. We have uh, combined about $820,000 in 401ks, Roth IRAs, and um, non-retirement IRAs. Non In non-retirement IRAs, 420 in non-retirement IRAs? What's that, Mark? I don't know if you mean non-retirement accounts. And 280 grand in savings. He'll be eligible for a pension of $38,000 a year at age 55. That's when he plans to retire. 55? Come on. He makes 75 grand a year. I make $100,000 a year. I want to retire in two years when I turn 50. During that time, we will add about $84,000 a year in retirement. If I were to retire at 50, we would stop contributing to our retirement in order to live off of a single income. Our only debt is a mortgage. Cheap. Do you think we have enough in retirement to make this leap? I don't know. That's a long retirement. I don't think it sounds like enough to me. Yeah, you don't say what you spend. I, I, I don't think it's going to work. Uh, I, I, but send us more information about what you spend. Let's get more numbers before I pronounce you thumbs up, thumbs down. Everyone listening knows that I hate the idea of retiring in your 50s because it takes it's a, such a long retirement. I mean, unless there's some particular reason, and especially if you're not going to work anymore. I don't know. It's tough. Yeah. 40 years of unemployment, as Michael Goodman likes to call it, right? Does say what he calls it? Unemployment? All right. Uh, if you are considering this, send us more details. Let us know. We'll help you weigh the factors. Um, but four decades, long time to finance. That's all I can say. You are listening to Jill on Money. Here is an idea. During the break, go to our website, jillonmoney.com. Sign up for our free weekly newsletter. It comes out every Friday. Mark does a fantastic job curating beautiful content of financial matters. Maybe we should start putting sports things in there as well. You never know. We could. Probably not. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. 
year back. It's Jill on Money. If you have a financial question that is really bugging you, or maybe not even bugging you, but just sort of think, keeping you busy, your brain is working too hard considering it, why don't you let us help you? Mark and I would be delighted to be your coaches from afar, your financial coaches. And the easiest way to get in touch with us is to send an email. And that address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That's what JD did. JD writes, I enjoy listening to your podcast. Your humor really livens up the usual dry subject of finances. From listening, I know you're an advocate of Roth retirement accounts. And in many cases, you've recommended transferring funds from traditional retirement accounts to Roth accounts, meaning converting them. Okay. JD says, my primary question concerns the recommended timing and amounts of such transfers that make sense for our situation. I am 61. My wife is 60. We both enjoy good health. Our jobs are demanding, stressful, not as satisfying as they once were. We are both considering retirement sooner rather than later. How soon? Could be next month. Could be four or five years. We're wishy-washy that way. (laughs) Our two kids are in their mid-20s working and supporting themselves. They've got combined income, pretty much split between the two of them, 360 grand. All income sources and tax deductions considered were just a hair into the 32% tax bracket federal, and they they live in a high-tax state. I currently max out my annual contribution to my company's Roth 401k, but for the mass, vast majority of my career, I maxed out uh, the traditional, of course, because you were working for many years when you didn't have that option. Uh, my wife maxes out her annual contribution to her company's traditional 401k. There is no Roth option available. Our annual expenses fluctuate, but on average, about $130,000. That number could go up after we retire due to increased leisure and travel. Okay. We do not carry any long-term care insurance. Okay. Assets, no debt. I like that. Start with the right side of the balance sheet. House is paid for. It's worth about $2 million. We have no near-term plans to move. Though moving after retirement, not out of the question. House would uh, generate a big capital gains of a million bucks even after the uh, exclusion. Our combined traditional retirement accounts, $4 million. The Roth, $390,000. They've got uh, a taxable brokerage account with $1.4 million in it. And they've got cash on hand, which is, you know, checking savings, two hundred seventy grand. Let me get to the point. Because the big chunk of change in the traditional retirement accounts, we're looking at a very large future tax hit um, on ourselves and probably also on the children after my wife and I are gone. I'm interested in minimizing that hit as much as possible, primarily through prudent transfers of funds from traditional to Roth accounts. A case could be made for us retiring now because with the loss in income from being unemployed, it would allow us to make large annual transfers to the Roth without increasing our home and tax rate. But let's say we don't retire right away. Should we still make annual transfers from traditional into Roth, knowing the first dollar of that added income is going to be hit with a 32% bracket? Hmm. Of course, that question would be easier to answer if you had a crystal ball and knew what future tax rates would be beyond 2025. I'll tell you where they're going to be, probably at that 30%. And the secondary question is, being a big believer in long-term gains of stocks as compared to bonds, our retirement accounts and brokerage accounts have never strayed from being 100% in stocks, mutual funds, and ETFs. I realize you're frowning at this aggressive investing option at this stage in my our lives, but I'm willing to take my scolding and would like to ask you your recommendation concerning a smarter allocation. Thanks and don't ever retire from your podcast. That's what Mark says, my retirement. Hmm. Okay. One thing that you didn't actually tell us again is how much do you really want to spend when you say, okay, we're going to spend this, but you say, but it could be much more. So right now you say 130,000, right? Didn't they say 130 or 35,000? 130,000. They average 130,000. But he said that number could go up after we retire. By how much? I mean, that's an important part of this, right? Because if you need that money, then we need to probably bulk up some of your non-retirement savings even more. Let's just look at the numbers as they stand right here. You've got about 6 million bucks, okay? Even under a very conservative estimate, okay? If we took $6 million and we said, 
how much money do, can you generate? You know, 150 grand wouldn't be so bad. I mean, a lot of that would be pre-tax, right? I think you have to remember that as you start to convert this, you really would have to, um, you'd be left with less money because, you know, that $4 million is just, just knock it down by a third, right? It's really $3 million. And so I'm not sure that I would start converting at the 32% bracket. On one hand, I'd like to say, yeah, just go convert it. But a couple of things with that. Number one is you got to pay the tax on it. That means you're going to have to sell the assets in your brokerage account, take the capital gain right there, and then pay the tax that's due. So I'm just saying that if you look at your $6 million that you have right now, it ain't $6 million. You are going to have to have a big tax that's due. I don't know where taxes are going. I would never say that you should retire to put yourself in a lower tax bracket because that just means you're starting to spend the corpus of your assets down. I'll tell you what I think you should do. I think you should run your own retirement numbers. And I think you might want to get some help on this one. I mean, I would look at either a, a, a certified financial planner or an accountant to give you some of their advice. I don't know. I'm leaning against not converting right now. Um, I, and I think that it would be helpful also if, if you maybe would convert you know, a couple of years from now, during this process, I would totally, for your wife, I would stop putting money in the 401k. I really would. I would just build up my non-retirement assets. Okay. Thank you so much for sending us that note. It's Jill on Money. When we return, more of your questions. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we're here to help you out. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. That's what Matt did. Who He writes, Hi, Jill. I've been reading you in the Chicago Tribune for many years and listening to the podcast for a few months. Hmm, thank you. There are things which seem to come up at least once a week on the podcast, like don't pay down the mortgage. I'm surprised that you don't seem to frequently voice an opinion on HSAs, health savings accounts. HSA seem like the perfect combination of pre-tax investment and tax-free withdrawal. Can you explain why it isn't a common topic or recommendation on the pod, especially as a priority for the youngest and healthiest? Yes, because a lot of people don't have HSA opportunities. You don't actually, you have to have it through a high deductible health insurance plan, and many people don't have that option. So HSAs are not available to the vast majority of people. So you're right. You are lucky um, that you have that. And I love the HSA. I think it's awesome, but that's the real reason that we don't we don't do it. So I'm glad you've come out far ahead. I'm glad that you're in good health. I love the HSA. I sure do hope that people are able to access them more and more because I think paying for healthcare in the future is going to be really hard for folks. And it's great to have that money. And it is a good combination of tax efficiency, tax free and a way to address rising healthcare costs. So way to go, Matt. Thanks for raising it as an issue, but that's really the reason why. We usually respond to just what people are writing into us about. So if you have an HSA question, send us a note. Okay, we're coming to the end of the program, and I should basically remind you this all the time, and that is that our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer, and fantastic one at that. As we come to the end of a program, I know we've hit these terrible milestones in the virus. So I'm, I'm just going to keep saying this till basically everyone is inoculated and we're past this period. Wash your hands. Please wear your masks. Mark, I've been starting to wear double masks. Maintain your physical distancing and do something nice for someone else today. Just make that a priority because if you do that, you will feel better. You'll make that person feel better. It's like putting good juju in the universe. So do that. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget, if you have a question, you can always send us an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. We'll talk to you next week.